Well, now I want to talk about a tale of two food webs and really talk about two different kinds of food webs that we find in the world ocean. And this is really a revolutionary idea. This idea that there are two different kinds of food webs in the world ocean really has yet to even play itself out because as we continue to explore the world ocean and particularly as we continue to explore microbes in the world ocean, the kinds of interactions that we see among organisms are truly astonishing and they're really helping us to sort of redraw the map in terms of food webs. But in the mid-1970s, there was growing recognition that a certain group of microbes, both uh, phytoplankton, very different kind of small phyto phytoplankton, as well as small zooplankton, different types of zooplankton, didn't quite belong in our traditional way of thinking about food webs. And this led to what has been called the microbial revolution in oceanography. It's only 30s or so years old, and it's still continuing, as I said, to astonish us today. But let's take a look at how this came about. Really since the Challenger expedition in the late 1980s, oceanographers really kind of believe that food webs consisted of phytoplankton, zooplankton, small fishes, marine mammals, and birds. This is what we call the classical food web. It's the one that's been studied for the last, ever since the Challenger expedition. So for the last 130 years or so, um, in essence, or over at least 100 years. And it's one that humans are the most concerned about because in a sense it includes what we eat. The fish that are produced as a result of zooplankton and phytoplankton are organisms we're interested in. We consume those organisms. And so a lot of oceanographic research, particularly in the early days, was really focused on trying to determine what leads to a more productive fisheries. How do phytoplankton and zooplankton fuel the growth of different kinds of fishes? And it's this classical food web that really dominated oceanography and ocean ecology for about 100 years or so. Well, in 1974, John Steele published this book called The Structure of Marine Ecosystems. And really, he, it really epitomized and represents sort of the pinnacle of thinking in terms of this classic model, the phytoplankton, zooplankton, fishes, marine mammals, and birds. And as I say here, boy, oceanographers really thought they had it figured out. And his book is a classic, and it's a wonderful book. The problem is, we didn't stop studying the ocean after 1974. Meanwhile, we were developing new techniques. The discovery of the electron microscope, the discovery of better ways of filtering microbes out of the ocean, different kinds of chemical analyses of microbes in the ocean, soon thereafter discovery of genetic techniques for discerning different kinds of genetic materials in the oceans. All these little techniques led to, in essence, a revolution. It's a kind of Kuhn type revolution. Thomas Kuhn wrote about the structure of scientific revolutions. This really was a sea change for oceanographers when in the late 1970s we discovered the small zooplankton, small phytoplankton, small gelatinous organisms, and heterotrophic bacteria. In that same year that John Steele wrote his book, The, the Structure of Marine Ecosystems, Larry Pomeroy published a paper called The Ocean's Food Web, A Changing Paradigm. And so the net result of this is that we have two food webs in the ocean, the classical food web and now what's called the microbial food web. This was really bolstered by several researchers in the late 70s and, and through the 80s and even in the 90s and even now in recent times with the discovery of some new kinds of symbiotic organisms that microbial organisms actually kind of operate on a different time and space scale from the larger phytoplankton, zooplankton fish of the classical food web. A good example is the discovery of cyanobacteria in 1979, particularly the species Sinecococcus. Another one discovered in 1988, Prochlorococcus, that we uh, talked about a little bit in chapter 13. 
a discovery of marine viruses, discovery again in, in recent times of many different kinds of microbes that function and operate in ways that we just couldn't even imagine even a decade ago has really changed our thinking. And Dave Carlin at the University of Hawaii um, I think has the most elegant expression to it. Our understanding of the marine ecosystem is hidden in a sea of microbes. And if you think about the two food webs, the classical food web is really, in a sense, the one that we can see, which is why we concentrated on it for a hundred years or so. The microbial food web is hidden to us in some sense. We have to use microscopic techniques and chemical techniques and other kinds of analyses, analytical methods, to study the sea of microbes. And the more we do so, the more incredible it gets. In 1990, Researchers at Oregon State University discovered Pelagibacter ubique. We, we already talked about that. The most abundant marine bacterium in the upper ocean, as far as we know. In 2007, Craig Ventner um, of human genome fame took his sorcerer two out into the ocean and began to discover an incredible diversity in the genetics of material in the world ocean. And you can check out some of his stuff here at this website. What we've come to learn in the last decade or two, really since the mid 1970s, is that the world ocean is dominated by microbes and microbial processes. Now, where have you heard that before? Since the beginning of this class, I've tried to give you some perspective of the importance of microorganisms, little tiny microbes. They really rule the ocean. And as it turns out, probably, they really rule the world. Were our planet, by some natural catastrophe or human-made catastrophe, to be completely wiped out of all larger organisms, humans, and anything that you can see, the microbes would be perfectly happy without us. They may not be. I mean, if they have any thought process, they might miss us, but I doubt it. But they would be able to function and survive and reproduce and carry on on the planet, just like as ever before. That may be a sobering thought or a depressing thought, I find it kind of uplifting and optimistic knowing that no matter how much we screw up on our planet, life will continue to persist because of these amazing microbes. And it's certainly true in the, in the, in the ocean that microbes and microbial processes are really the dominant processes in terms of biogeochemical cycles, in terms of the carbon cycle, in terms of all the different kinds of things that, the, that go on in the ocean essentially how the ocean works as a system is dominated by microbes. And though we'd like to think that the classical food web and the things we're interested in, the whales and dolphins and seals and sea lions and all those kinds of things are important, and as much as we love Flipper, he just doesn't matter that much in the whole scheme of how the ocean works. Now, of course, Flipper and Shamu and Keiko the whale, all of them matter because they inspire us, of course, they matter for different reasons, but in terms of how the ocean works as a system, it's the microbes where it's at. Here's Craig Ventner's Sorcerer 2 sailboat, and were you to choose a career in oceanography, or maybe you're even thinking about a career in molecular biology, you could combine your interest in sailing and being at the ocean and working aboard a boat like this. This is perhaps the future of oceanography. Something to think about if you like visiting faraway places and traveling on a sailboat and doing molecular biology. I'd give Craig Ventner a call if you're interested in that.